travel by train and airplane from California to the east or from the east to California is the modern achievement in transportation. To save time, to see America first, and to enjoy the real fun of flying, I recommend it to you. And I am sure Colonel Lindbergh, who is chairman of our technical committee, and Mr. C.M. Keyes, one of America's pioneers in airplane transportation, who are sitting here with me, also recommended to you. Incidentally, you see Colonel Lindbergh in this picture making one of his regular inspection trips over the route which he helped to select for this great rail airline. And now, just picture yourself taking this rail and air journey to California, starting any day of the year at six o'clock in the evening from the city of New York. In the heart of New York, a great railroad station marks the beginning of your transcontinental rail and air journey from coast to coast. Here, at any one of the windows, we buy our tickets to California, as simply as we would ordinarily buy just the rail ticket alone. Then, at the gateway to the train, friends see us off. There's a new kind of spirit in the air each day when this train departs. It's like those moments before a smart deluxe liner sets sail for Paris and the Riviera. And at exactly 6.5 p.m., the Airway Limited, first and only train of its kind in the world, with a direct airline connection, pulls out with its air-minded guest. From New York to Columbus, Ohio, dinner, bedtime, breakfast the next morning, and then, a few minutes later, the Airway Limited pulls into Port Columbus, where our first day is flying will begin. At each of these air terminals, we find unexpected comforts and conveniences, beautifully appointed restrooms, and courteous attendants who look after our traveling needs. Here at Port Columbus, our baggage is weighed. 30 pounds is the allowance. It is 8.15 in the morning now, time to take off. The big tri-motor all-metal plane is ready and waiting, equipped like a Pullman car. Its roomy cabin is well-lighted and heated in wintertime. Seated in our comfortable chairs, we are all set now to see America best. The field rushes by. Then, all is flowing smoothly. The city of Columbus, Ohio quickly passes under us with a majestic skyscraper serving notice on air travelers that other cities beside New York have their symbols of America reaching upward. And now, ahead of us, we can see the train on which we left New York. It remains ahead of us for only a moment or two. We are on our first hop to Indianapolis, 180 miles to the west, less than two hours by air. The courier is looking after our comfort. Souvenir maps are spread before you. You begin to look for familiar landmarks. Arriving at the airport at Indianapolis, and at this same time, at every airport along the route, the teletype system reports the news on our progress. Here at the general office, they read the flash of our arrival. And so through the day, mile after mile, our plane is watched, reported on, prepared for at our next stop, which now will be St. Louis, 232 miles away. Two hours later, nearing St. Louis, we see the Missouri and Mississippi rivers joining into one, then a long, smooth glide to a landing another 15-minute pause in our journey westward. We are taking this trip in the wintertime. As a matter of fact, it is eight below zero as most of these scenes are made. But modern air travel is a year-round accomplished fact, and airliners nowadays are as snug and comfortable as your own private yacht. Here at St. Louis, you step out again for a stroll around. 
while the motors are being inspected and additional fuel is put aboard. These motors, incidentally, are looked after as carefully as a fine watch. And after being in use for a specified number of hours, each motor is completely overhauled by a corps of experts working under the supervision of Colonel Lindbergh. As technical advisor to the airline, Colonel Lindbergh has instilled his own insistence upon perfect motor performance, overhauling and frequent replacements, which from his experience is the way to safety in flying. Take a look at the pilot's weather report. An army of trained observers compile these records, making observations daily and hourly over the entire line. Here, an observer is following the course of a gas-filled balloon to determine wind direction and velocity at varying altitudes. These and other hourly observations are condensed into reports which your pilots receive each time the plane lands. And now, aboard our plane, a dainty and satisfying luncheon is served aloft. 5,000 feet in the air, at a speed of more than 100 miles per hour, we'll travel at least 90 miles before we even arrive at dessert. Air travel, you soon learn, is like ocean travel when it comes to stimulating a healthy appetite. We are now passing over Kansas City. We come into land at its convenient airport, then on to Wichita, Kansas, 173 miles as the crow flies. Westbound plane calling radio ground station at Wichita. TAT Maddox, radio ground station at Wichita, answering westbound plane. Westbound plane reporting position. We are now passing over Granville. Okay on your position. Are you on time? Go ahead, please. We are flying exactly on schedule. We'll arrive at Wichita on time. What is the surface wind at Wichita? The surface wind at Wichita is east-southeast, eight miles per hour. Oh, say, Bill, Lindbergh's on the line. He ought to be passing your ship about now. Lindbergh's making an inspection trip of the line today. Fine, we'll watch for him. Good news about Lindbergh. We'll be looking for him. Okay, goodbye. Hey, Joe, they're making pictures up here today. We're in the movies now, boy. So long. This radio communication is one of the greatest factors of safety in modern air travel. And now, Colonel Lindbergh, on a coast-to-coast -coast inspection of the line, passes our ship in midair. He throttles down to look things over. That's the Colonel's office he's riding in. You're seeing Colonel Lindbergh on the job at work. And now we are coming to Wichita, where there are so many airplane factories. The words fly away Wichita will soon be almost as well known as FOB Detroit. And then on the last lap of our first day's flying, we see what smart western farmers plant for farm relief. A swarm of oil derricks cover the landscape. We are in Oklahoma now. We have traveled almost a thousand miles by air. As the sun sinks down into the west, an aero car whisks us to town where an appetizing dinner awaits.
Now again, it is nighttime, and you are asleep aboard the Santa Fe Railway. Morning finds us in Clovis, New Mexico, where another plane with new pilots and a new kind of countryside await our second day's flying. Today, the rugged west will unroll beneath you. But though there be rocks and deserts and mighty mountains everywhere to your untrained eyes, your pilots know this route as you know your way home. And they know that within easy gliding distance, there is always a landing field to be used if necessary. A delegation of 100% Americans, keenly interested in air travel and air travel. They gather here to sell you some of their native handiwork. attended to your shopping, and while the ship is being refueled and inspected, Chief Tippecanoe of the local tribe brings in future young braves for a look at white man's latest surprise. Squaw and Papoos, too, are included in this personally conducted tour. And if you should ask the chief what the Indian name for airplane is, he will tell you Oche Kutiwal, which means wagon like a bird. Albuquerque on a 240-mile hop to Winslow, Arizona. We fly over the Mesa Gigante, then on through a bank of silvery clouds, round the tops of the San Mateo Mountains. Now, certainly you are coming to country worth riding home about. Next, the painted desert swims into view, with colors of violet, amber, and rose. To the north, the petrified forests of Arizona. South the Apache Indians' favorite hunting ground. Here also was the hunting ground of Billy the Kid, that famous bandit of the wild and woolly west. Your next stop will be Kingman, Arizona, 186 miles on the map, just an hour and a half to you. On one of the many souvenir postcards of your trip is a picture of the famous meteor crater. We are coming to it now, a mighty hole three miles in circumference, which scientists tell us was made by a falling star. In the bottom, we can see the huts of the geologists who are digging down to the treasures which, they say, this meteor contains. Then, with a suddenness that thrills, great chasms and canyons flash into view, a ruggedness and a beauty which only air travelers are privileged to see. This is the famous Lee's Canyon you've heard about. A pair of binoculars brings into view its giant fingers of very colored stone, like a mighty pipe organ in a cathedral of the gods. We're leaving Kingman, Arizona now, for the last hop of our trip from coast to coast, 300 miles to the city of Los Angeles. We will have crossed the country in less than 48 hours. Passing over the Colorado River, which forms the dividing line of three states. In the bend of this river, we can see a part of Arizona, Nevada, and California. 
Then a vast stretch of desert lies before us. The Devil's Collar Button in the Mojave Desert of California. Death Valley lies 60 miles to the north. These are the lands over which the pioneers struggled in their covered wagons. Where once it took weeks and months to cross this vast expanse, we are now winging our way across in little more than an hour. How do you do, Mr. Cook? Mr. Cook, Mr. Earhart. How do you do, Mr. Cook? You know, Mr. Earhart, we've had a marvelous trip. I'm going back the same way. I'm glad to hear it. 